Suppose a ball is dropped from a height of 10 feet and the ball just keeps bouncing. And every time it bounces, it bounces back up to 80% of its previous height. Now, my question to you is in an idealized Newtonian world, will the ball bounce forever? Now the ball will bounce infinitely many times just by the nature of the way that we've set up the problem. But the question is, will this happen in a finite amount of time or an infinite amount of time? Now it turns out the total distance traveled by the ball is gonna be finite. So the ball initially drops from a height of 10 feet and then it bounces back up to a height of eight feet and then down eight feet. And then it bounces back up to a height of 6.4 feet and down 6.4 and so on. And if you add up these distances that the ball is traveling, it turns out you get a geometric series, a series that converges. So the total distance traveled by the ball is gonna be finite. And we'll calculate that total distance in a minute. But the question is about the time. Now the time between bounces is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the question is, if we add up the, those time intervals, are we gonna get a series that converges or a series that diverges? So in other words, will the ball continue to bounce forever with just these sort of smaller and smaller vibrations or will it eventually stop bouncing? Now, just to be clear, we're talking about an idealized world here where we don't need to take into account quantum effects. So things like a Planck length or a Planck time. So we're not really dealing with the real world here, but who really wants to deal with the real world anyway? I know I don't, I'm a pure mathematician. I don't have to deal with air resistance and friction and all this messy ugliness. No, I wanna be up in the heaven of pure mathematics. And so that's what we're gonna do in this video. So let's go ahead and get started. Now we'll begin by looking at the total distance traveled by the ball. And we'll define these numbers, d sub zero will be 10 or 10 feet. That's the initial height of the first drop. d sub one will be the height the ball bounces to after the first bounce, which would be eight feet. d sub two will be the height it bounces to after the second bounce and so on. And notice we'll have a general formula for d sub k. d sub k will be 10 times 0.8 to the k. So notice for example, d sub two is 6.4. But isn't 6.4 really just 10 times 0.8 times 0.8? Or in other words, it's 10 times 0.8 squared. So notice d sub 2 will be 10 times 0.8 squared. So we have this general formula for d sub k. Now the total distance traveled by the ball is going to be 10 plus 8 plus 8 plus 6.4 plus 6.4 and so on. So we have this initial drop of 10 feet and then we go up 8 feet, down 8 feet, up 6.4, down 6.4 and so on. And so the total distance is really d sub zero plus d sub one plus d sub one plus d sub two plus d sub two and so on. Now the d sub zero only happens once so we can separate that out here and write this as d sub zero plus two times the quantity d one plus d two plus d three and so on. And we can write this in a more compact way using sigma notation. So this is really just the sum from k equals one to infinity of d sub k. And now remember d sub k was 10 times 0.8 to the k. And so what we have here is a convergent geometric series. So we can factor out the 10. We can bring the 10 out front and write this as two times 10, which is 20. So our total distance is gonna be 10 plus 20 times the sum from k equals one to infinity of 0.8 to the k. But this is a geometric series. And if you know about geometric series, this is gonna converge to 0.8 over one minus 0.8. Now I'll explain that in just a second here, but This ends up being 0.8 over 0.2, which is really four. And we get 10 plus 20 times four or 10 plus 80, which is 90. So the total distance traveled by the ball ends up being 90 feet. Okay, now what about going from here to here? Where did that come from? Well, I'm gonna make another video where I really explain about geometric series, but the idea is this. If the absolute value of R is less than one, so if R is between minus one and one, then the sum from k equals one to infinity of r to the k, so this is really just r plus r squared plus r cubed and so on, this ends up equaling r over one minus r. And this is a remarkable little formula. In fact, one of the things that it implies is that you can add infinitely many positive numbers and not get infinity. So for example, if you let r be one half in this formula, you get one half plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on. This ends up equaling one. In fact, you can try this on a calculator, do 0.5 plus 0.25 and add more and more of these numbers, it's gonna get closer and closer to one. You do a similar thing with R equals one third, you get one third plus one ninth plus one over 27 and so on. This series is gonna converge to one half. In fact, this one is really nice. If you let R be one tenth, you get 
one tenth plus one one hundredth, and so on. If you look at the decimal expansion for this, this is really just point 0.1 repeating, and that equals one ninth. So this is an amazing little formula here for what we call geometric series. Now, I'm not in this video going to explain where the formula comes from. Basically, I can scroll through here. There's a little explanation that you could give, but I'll give this in my other video I'll make on geometric series. But this really explains how we got from here to here. We had a geometric series where the R was 0.8. All right, so the total distance traveled by the ball is finite. It's 90 feet. But what about the time? To figure out the total time, we're going to need to use the equations of free fall motion. So let's derive these equations. Now, the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth, which we label G, is about 32 feet per second squared. In terms of meters, this would be about 9.81 meters per second squared. But our problem is set up in terms of feet. So we'll use 32 for G. Now, suppose we have an object that's in free fall motion, essentially an object that we've just dropped at time t equals zero. And we will let x of t be the height of the object or the position of the object at time t. So notice that x of zero would be the initial height, the height when you drop it. And v of t will be the velocity at time t and a of t will be the acceleration. Now, the acceleration is just constant. It's just negative g. And the reason it's negative is because the object is accelerating downward. All right, so how can we find formulas for the position and velocity? Well, remember that the rate of change of the position at time t is the velocity at time t. And the rate of change of the velocity is the acceleration. So in other words, the derivative of x of t will be v of t. And the derivative of v of t will be a of t. So to get from a of t back to v of t, we have to do an integral. And the integral of negative g is just negative gt. Well, isn't it really negative gt plus a constant, plus a c? Well, that constant would just be v of 0, the initial velocity. But the initial velocity is just 0 because we're dropping the object from rest. So what about the position? Well, again, we have to do the integral. And the integral of v of t, the integral of negative gt, will be negative gt squared over 2. Or in other words, negative 1 half gt squared. And then plus a constant, plus that c. But the c is just x of 0, the initial height or the initial position. Now, we can just rewrite this as x of 0 minus x of t equals 1 half gt squared. And it'll be positive 1 half gt squared. And x of 0 minus x of t, that's the initial height minus the height at time t. So that's essentially how much the object has, has dropped during the first t seconds. We'll actually call that d. D will be the distance that the object drops during the first t seconds, and that's equal to 1 half gt squared. So I've written it down here. How far d, the distance an object drops in t seconds, will be d equals 1 half gt squared. Now, if we want to figure out how much time it takes to drop a distance d, we need to essentially solve this for t. So if we solve this for t, what do we get? Well, we multiply both sides by 2. We get 2d equals gt squared. So t squared equals 2d over g. So t is the square root of 2d over g. So how much time t it takes to drop a distance of d will be the square root of 2d over g. Now at this point, let's just plug in our 32 for g. So this is going to say 16t squared. And we can rewrite this as the square root of well, 2 over g will be 2 over 32, which is 1 over 16. So we can rewrite this as the square root of d over 16. Now, just like before, we defined these numbers d sub k for our ball. So d sub k was the height of the kth drop. We're going to define some time intervals, which we call t sub k. So we're going to let t sub k be the time it takes to drop from a height d sub k to the ground. So the total distance is dropping is d sub k. So for example, t sub 0 will be the time it takes to drop from a height of d sub 0, that initial height of 10 feet to the ground. And t sub 1 will be the time it takes to drop from that second height, the height of 8 feet to the ground. And of course, we'll have to take into account the fact that the ball is both going up and down on these hops. So notice here that based on this formula, t sub k will be the square root of d sub k over 16. Now the total time traveled by the ball will be t0 plus t1 plus t1 plus t2 plus t2 and so on. Now remember t0 was the time that it took to drop from that initial height of 10 feet to the ground. 
T1 is the time that it takes to drop from that second height, the height of eight feet to the ground. But it has to go both up that hop and down the hop. And the amount of time that it takes to go up is the same as the amount of time that it takes to go down. And we have to do that on each of the hops. Now, if we actually do these calculations, T sub zero is the square root of 10 sixteenths, which is about 0.791 seconds. That's how long it takes to drop from a height of 10 feet to the ground. And then it takes 0.707 seconds to go from the ground back up to eight feet. And then another 0.70 seconds to drop from eight feet to the ground. And so we can work out these numbers. So notice the total time traveled by the ball can be written as T sub zero plus two times the quantity T1 plus T2 plus T3 and so on. And of course we can write this in summation notation. This is just two times the sum from K equals one to infinity of T sub K. And remember the T sub K is the square root of D sub K over 16. And also remember that D sub K is 10 times 0 0.8 to the K. Now we can rewrite this as the square root of 10 sixteenths times the square root of 0 0.8 to the K. And we can take the square root of 10 sixteenths out front. And what we end up with is the square root of 0 0.8 to the K. But that's the same thing as the square root of 0 0.8, then raised to the K. That's just a property of exponents there. But notice this is a geometric series here where our R is the square root of 0 0.8. And the square root of 0 0.8 is about 0 0.89. So we have a geometric series again. And so the series is going to converge to the square root of 0.8 divided by 1 minus the square root of 0.8. That's that r over 1 minus r. And this turns out that it's about 14.2. And by the way, here I also plugged in the value that we found up here for t sub 0, which was this number right here. And when you work all that out, you get 14.2 for the total time. So the ball does not continue to bounce forever. The ball accomplishes those infinitely many bounces in about 14.2 seconds.